Chapter 2 I believe I first realized I was going to like the Australian outback when I read that the symptom desert, an area bigger than some European countries, was named in 1932 for a manufacturer of washing machines, specifically Alfred Simpson, who founded an aerial survey. It wasn't so much the pleasing, unheroic nature of the name as the knowledge that an expanse of Australia more than 100,000 miles square didn't even have a name until less than 70 years ago. I have near relatives who have had names longer than that. But then there's the thing about out the outback. It's so vast and forbidding that much of it is still scarcely charted. Even Bululu, as we must learn to call Ayers Rock, was unseen by anyone but its aboriginal caretakers until only a little over a century ago. It's not even possible to say quite where the outback is. To Australians, anything vaguely rural is the bush. At some indeterminated point, the bush becomes the outback. Push on for another 2,000 miles or so, and eventually you come to bush again, and then a city, and then a sea. That's, and that's Australia. And so, in the company of a photographer, Trevor Ray Hart, an amiable young man in shorts and faded t-shirt, I took a cab to Sydney's central station, an imposing heap of bricks on Elizabeth Street, and there we found our way through its dim and venerable concourse to our train. Stretching for a third of a mile along the curving platform, the Indian Pacific was everything the Bourget illustrations had promised. Silverly sleek, shiny as new nickel, coming with that sense of impending adventure that comes with the start of a long journey on a powerful machine. Carriage G, one of 17 on the train, was in the charge of a cheerful steward named Terry, who thoughtfully provided a measure of local color by accompanying every remark with an upbeat Ozzy turn of phrase. Need a glass of water? No worries, mate. I'll get right on you. Just received a word that your mother has died? Not the drama, she'll be apples. He showed us to a berth a pair of singles on opposite sides of a narrow panelled corridor. The cabins were astoundingly tiny, so tiny that you could bend over and actually get stuck. This is it, I said in mild consternation. In its entirety? No worries, Terry beamed. She's a bit snug, but you find she's got everything you need. And he was right. Everything you could possibly require in a living space was there. It was just very compact, not much larger than a standard wardrobe. But it was a marvel of ergonom er ergonomics. ergonomics. It included a comfy built-in seat a hideaway basin and toilet, a miniature cupboard, an overhead shelf that large enough for one very small suitcase, two reading lights, a pair of clean towels, and a little amenity bag. In the wall was a narrow drop-down bed, which didn't so much drop down as fall out like a hastily stowed corpse as I and I expected many other giddily experimental passengers discovered after looking ruminatively at the door, thinking, I wonder what's behind there. Still, it did make for an interesting surprise, 
and freeing my various facial protuberances from its coiled springs helped to pass the half hour before the departure. And then at least, at last, the train thrummed to life and we slipped regally out of Sydney Central. We were on our way. Done in one fell swoop, swoop, the journey to Perth takes nearly three days. Our instructions, however, were to disembark at the old mining town of Broken Hill to sample the outback and see what might bite us. So for Trevor and me, the rail journey would be in two parts, an overnight run to Broken Hill and then a two-day howl across the Nullabar. The train trundled, trundled out through the endless western suburbs of Sydney, through Flemington, Auburn, Parramatta, Doonside, and the adorably named Rooty Hill, then picked up a little speed as we entered the Blue Mountains, where the houses thinned out and we were treated no longer, no, treated to long end of afternoon views across steep sided vales and hazy forests of gum trees whose quiet respirations give the hills their epon eponymous tinge. I went off to explore the trains. Our domains, the first class section, consisted of five sleeping cars, a dining car in a plush and velvety style that might be called fin de siècle, fin de siècle, brothel keeper, and a lounge car in a rather more modern mode. This was provisioned with soft chairs, a small promising looking bar, and low but relentless piped music from a 20 volume compilations called At the Guess, songs you hoped you'd never hear again. A mournful duet from The Phantom of the Opera was playing as I passed through. Beyond first class was a slightly cheaper holiday class which was much the same as ours except that their dining area was a buffet car with bare plastic tables. These people apparently needed wiping down after meals. The passage beyond the holiday class was barred by a windowless door which was locked. What's back there? I asked the buffet car girl. Coach class, she said with a shudder. Is this door always locked? She nodded, gravely. Always. Coach class would become my obsession. But first it was time for dinner. The PA system announced the first set sitting. Ethel Marmon was belting out. There's no business like show business as I passed back through the first class lounge. Say what you say, the woman has had lungs. For all its air of cultivated venerability, the Indian Pacific is actually an infant as rail systems go, having been created as recently as 1969 when a new standard gauge line was built across the country. Before that, for various arcane reasons, mostly to do with regional distrust and envy, Australian railroad lines employed different gauges. New South Wales had rails four feet eight and a half inches apart. Victoria opted for a more commodious 5 feet 3 inches. Queensland and Western Australia economically decided on a standard of 3 feet 6 inches, a width not far off that of amusement park rides. P 
people must have ridden with their legs out the window. South Australia inevitably had all three. Five times on any journey between the east and west coast passengers in flight had to be offloaded from one train and re redeposited on another, a mad and tedious process. Finally, sanity was mustered and, and an all new line was built. It is the second longest line in the world after Russia's Trans-Siberian. I know all this because Trevor and I sat at dinner with a pair of quiet middle-aged teachers from rural North Queensland, Keith and Daphne. This was a big trip for them on teachers' salaries and Keith had done his homework. He talked with enthusiasm about the train, the landscape, the recent bushfires. We were passing through Lithgow where hundreds of acres of bush had been scorched and two firefighters had lost their lives just a month earlier. But when I asked about Aborigines, the question of land reform had been much in the news. He grew suddenly vague and flustered. It's a problem, he said, staring hard at his food. At the school where I teach, Daphne went on hesitantly. The Aboriginal parents, well, they get their welfare check and spend it on drink and then go walk about. And their teachers have to, well, feed the children, you know, out of their own pockets, otherwise the children wouldn't eat. It's a problem, Keith said again, still fixed on his food. But they're lovely people, really, when they're not drinking. And that pretty much killed the conversation. After dinner, Trevor and I ventured into the lounge car. While Trevor went to the bar to order, I sank into an easy chair and watched the dusky landscape. It was farming country, vaguely arid. The background music I noted with idle interest had gone from much-loved show tune to party time at the nursing home. Roll up the barrel was just finishing when uh, we arrived and it was swiftly succeeded by Toot Toot Tootsie Goodbye. Interesting choice of music, I observed dryly to the young couple opposite me. Yes, lovely, they replied with simultaneous enthusiasm. Suppressing an urge to shriek, I turned in this in I turned in desperation to the man beside me, an educated looking older man in a suit which was striking because everyone else on the train was in casual wear. We chatted about this and that. He was re a retired solicitor from Canberra on his way to visit a son in Perth. He seemed a reasonable and perceptive sort, so I mentioned to him in the confiding in the confiding tone, my puzzling conversation with the school teachers from Queensland. Ah, Aborigines, he said, nodding solemnly. A great problem, so I gather. They want hanging, every one of them. I looked at him, startled, and found a face on the edge of fury. Every bloody one of them, he said, jaws trembling and with, without another word took his leave. Aborigines, I reflected, were something I would have to look into, but for the moment I decided to keep the conversations to simple matters, weather, scenery, popular show tunes, until I had a better grasp of things. The great, if obvious feature of a train as compared with a hotel room is that your view is ever-changing. In the morning I walked to a new world, 
red soil, scrubby vegetation, huge skies, and, and an encircling horizon broken only by an occasional skeletal, skeletal gum trees. As I peered bleary, blearily from my narrow perch, a pair of kangaroos flushed by the train bounced across the foreground. It was an exciting moment. We were definitely in Australia now. We arrived at Broken Hill just before 8 and stepped blinking from the train. An airless heat hung over the land, the kind of heat that hits you when you open an oven door and check a roast in Turkey. Waiting for us on the platform was Sonia Stubbing, a good-natured young woman from the regional tourist office who had been sent to collect us from the station and take us to pick up a rental car for a drive around the outback. How hot does it get there? Get here, I asked, breathing out hard. Well, the record's 48. I thought for a minute. That's 118 degrees, I said. She nodded serenely. It was 42 yesterday. Another brief calculation. 107 degrees. That's very hot, she nodded. Too hot. Broken Hill was a positively delightful little community, clean, trim, cheerfully prosperous. Unfortunately, this was not at all what we wanted. We wanted proper outback, a place where men were men and sheep were nervous. Here there were cafes and a bookstore, travel agents offering enticing packages to Bali and Singapore. They were even doing a Noel Coward play at the Civic Center. This wasn't the outback at all. This was the Hamptons with the heat turned up. Things took a more hopeful turn when we went to Glen Bodic Vehicle Hire to pick up a four-wheel drive for a two-day jaunt into the Beacon Wilderness. The eponymous Len was a wiry, wiry old guy, energetic and friendly, who looked as if he had spent every day of his life doing tough stuff in the out of doors. He jumped behind the wheel and gave us the kind of swift, thorough rundown that people give when they assume they're dealing with intelligent and capable listeners. The interior presented a bewildering assortment of dials, levers, knobs, gauges, and toggles. Now say you get stuck and in, stuck in sand and need to increase your offside differential. Len was saying on one of the intermittent occasions I dipped into the lecture. You move this handle forward like so. Select a hyperdrive ratio of between 12 and 27, elevate the ailerons, ail, ailerons said, and engage both thrust motors, but not the left hand one. That's very important. And whatever you do, watch your goals and don't go over 180 degrees on the combustorator, or the whole thing blow and you'll be stuck out there. He jumped out and handed us the keys. That's 25 liters of spare diesel in the back. That should be more than enough if you go wrong. He looked at each of us in turn more carefully. I'll get you some more diesel, he decided. Did you understand any of that? I whispered to Trevor when he had gone. Not past the putting the key in the ignition part. I called to Lynn. What happens if we get stuck or lost? Why, you die, of course. Actually, he didn't say that, but 
That's what I was thinking. I had been reading accounts of people who had been lost or stranded in the outback, like the explorer Ernest Giles, who spent days wandering waterless and half dead before coming fortunate for fortuitously on a baby wallaby that had tumbled from its mother's pouch. I pounced over it, Giles related in his memoirs, and ate it, living, raw, dying, fur, skin, bones, skull, and all. And this was one of the happiest stories. Beside, believe me, you don't want to get lost in the outback. I began to feel a tremor of foreboding, a feeling not lightened when Sonia gave a cry of delight at the sight of a spider by her feet and said, Hey look, a red back. A red back, if you don't know already, is death on eight legs. As Trevor and I whimperingly tried to climb into each other's arms, she snatched it up and held it out to us on the tip of her finger. It's alright, she giggled. It's dead. We peered cautiously at the little object on her fingertip, a tail telltale red hourglass shape on its shiny back. It seemed unlikely that Something so small could deliver instant agony, but make no mistake, a single nip from a red back's malicious jaws can result within minutes in frenzied twitching, a profuse flow of body fluids, and in the absence of prompt medical attention, possible death, or so the literature reports. You probably won't see any red backs out there, Sonia reassured us. Snakes are much more of a problem. This intelligence was received with four raised eyebrows and expressions that said, Go on. She nodded. Common brown western taipan, western puff pastry, yellow backed lockjaw, eastern Growing Groper, Dodge Viper. I don't remember what she said exactly, but it was a long list. But don't worry, she continued. Most snakes don't want to hurt you. If you're out in the bush and snake comes along, just stop dead and let it slide over your shoes. This, I decided, was the least likely to be followed advice I had ever been given. Our extra diesel loaded, we climbed aboard and with a grinding of gears, a couple of bronco lurches and a lively but inadvertent salute of windshield wipers took to the open road. Our instructions were to drive to Menin, Menindi, 110 kilometers to the east where we would be met by a man named Steve Garland. In the event, that drive to Menindi was something of an anticlimax. The landscape was shimmering hot and gorgeous, gorgeously forbidding. We were gratified to see a first willy willy, a column of rotating dust perhaps a hundred feet high, impressive but harmless, moving across the endless plain to our left. But this was as close to adventure as we got. The road was newly paved and relatively well traveled. While Trevor stopped to take pictures, I counted four cars pass. Had we broken down, we wouldn't have been stranded more than a few minutes. Mandy was a modest hamlet on a Darling River, a couple of streets of some baked bungalows, a gas station, two shops, the Buck and Wills Motel, 
named for a pair of 19th century explorers who inevitably came a cropper in the, uh, in the unforgiving outback and the semi-famous Maiden's Hotel where in 1860 the aforementioned Bark and Wills spent their last night in civilization before meeting their unhappy fate in the barren void to the north. We met Steve Garland at the motel and to celebrate our safe arrival and recent discovery of fifth gear, crossed the road to Maidens and joined the noisy hubbub within. Maidens' long bar was lined from end to end with some leathered men in shorts and sweat-stained muscle shirts and wide-brimmed hats. It was like stepping into a Paul Hogan movie. This was more like it. So which window do they eject the bodies through? I asked the amiable Steve when we were seated, thinking that Trevor would probably like to set up his equipment for a shot at checking out time. Oh, it's not like that here, he said. Things aren't as wild in the outback as people think. It's pretty civilized, really. He looked around with what was clearly real fondness and exchanged hellos with a couple of dusty-looking characters. Garland was a professional photographer in Sydney until his partner, Lisa Menk, was appointed chief warden of Kinchiga National Park up the road. He took a job as the Regional Tourism and Development Officer. His territory covered 26,000 square miles, an area half the size of England but with a population of just 2,500. His challenge was to persuade dubious locals that there are people in the world prepared to pay good money to vacation in a place that is vast, dry, empty, featureless, and ungodly hot. The other part of his challenge was to find such people. Between the merciless sun and isolation, outback people are not always the most gifted of communicators. We had heard of one shopkeeper who, upon being asked by a smiling visitor from Sydney where the fish were biting, stared at the man incredulously, incredulously for a long moment and replied, in the fucking river, mate, where do you think? Garland only grinned when I put the story to him, but conceded that there was a certain occasional element of challenge involved in getting the locals to see the possibilities inherent in tourism. He asked us how our drive had been. I told him that I had expected to, it to be a little more harsh. Wait till tomorrow, he said. 